welcome to 2024. Uh, one year from today, or actually 363 days from today, a new president will be sworn in. It'll actually be uh, potentially a second Biden term, potentially a second Trump term, potentially a first Nikki Haley term. Um, 4,000 political appointees will be installed across the federal government. 8,000 positions will be decided. And a president will have to pick their priorities and have to work backward from that to try to move them forward. It's an enormous undertaking. Um, and we are really delighted today to have three experts in uh, the most complicated transaction that happens on the planet. Um, We've had turbulent transitions before. Obviously, in 2021, we had a very turbulent transition, and we have experts on that transition with us today. But turbulent transitions are also not new. Uh, in 1800, we had the first peaceful, 1801, we had the first peaceful transfer of power from one political party to another ever in human history. Because prior to that, we didn't have democracies with competing parties. And that was not a particularly, it was a, ended up being a peaceful transition, but it was also turbulent. We've had turbulent transitions in 1824, 1860, 1876, 2000. And turbulent transitions may now be part of our future as well. To unpack all of that, we are particularly delighted to have a new book published by the University of Press in the Miller Center's series on the American presidency, which is ably led by our own Mark Silverstone and Guy and McKee. And the book is by Chris Liddell, and it is called Year, Year Zero, The Five-Year Presidency, and we're delighted to have Chris with us today to talk about that book. His book is concrete. It has nonpartisan recommendations. It's kind of the presidency as zen, if you will. It is an extraordinary accomplishment, and we're really proud not just to have the book, but to have Chris with us to talk about it today. And we're particularly thankful to our friends at the University of Virginia Press, Eric Brandt and Nadine Zimarelli, who helped pull this together and, and move it forward for us. Let's just think back to the transition that Chris helped usher for the Trump administration. Chris was President Trump's deputy chief of staff, and four years ago in that position, amidst COVID, amidst a turbulent handoff of power, together working with Ted Kaufman, President Biden's representative in the transition, he saw a peaceful transfer of power actually take place. Um, but the book is much more than about 2020, and he will talk about that. He talks about it in the book, and we'll talk about it a little bit today. It's a deeply researched book on the structure and functioning of the White House, how it works and how it doesn't work, what it can do and what it can't do. It's built not just on his 2020 transition experience, but his 2016, 2017 transition experience where he was brought in by the newly elected Trump administration to help see through the transition. And that in itself was based on work that he had done working with Mitt Romney in planning for a potential transition in 2013 after the 2012 election. Um, or as Chris refers to it as in the book as the ship that never sailed. Um, before that, Chris was a senior vice president and chief financial officer at Microsoft and vice chairman and chief financial officer at General Motors. To discuss the book with Chris and us today are two real experts on this. Um, to my immediate left is Dr. Martha Joint Kumar, who's the director of the White House Transition Project and an emeritus professor at Towson University. She's written two books, Before the Oath, How George W. Bush and Barack Obama Managed a Transfer of Power, and Managing the President's Message, the White House Communications Operation, which won the Richard Neustadt Award for the best book on the presidency from the American Political Science Association. We also, the far uh, end of our panel today, we have Dave Marchick, who wrote one of the first books in the Miller Center's series on the American presidency with the University of Virginia Press, The Peaceful Transfer of Power in 2022. Um, Dave served as the director of the Center for Presidential Transitions at the Partnership for Public Service, a nonprofit entity in Washington that helps incoming and outgoing administrations manage their transitions. And the book is actually a transcribed and edited 
a uh, series of podcasts that Dave conducted going back and looking at presidential transitions in American history with authors of great histories of these books, as well as practitioners from past presidential transitions. But he didn't just do this as an academic enterprise. He worked behind the scenes with the outgoing Trump administration and the incoming Biden administration, not just to do the mechanics of the transition, but as things became turbulent, how to walk through a number of uncertainties and unprecedented uh, operations. And we were really fortunate to get to work um, with Dave and a, an incredible team that he assembled. Um, Dave and I actually wrote an essay in the run-up to the election in 2016, looking at these previous turbulent presidential transition and what the lessons learned were from that. But let me just say, um, as a co-author of that piece, I was kind of like a co-pilot in the airplane. I'm glad there was a pilot on board uh, and that I was just there to make sure that um, I could fill in the gaps. Dave is currently the dean of the Kogood School of Business at American University. He has previous jobs both in government and in the private sector. And Dave and I worked together 25 years ago at the, uh, at the State Department. Before starting, I do want to introduce one very special guest who's here with us today. Um, and that's sitting here in the front row is Lauren Henry. Uh, here at the Miller Center, he's the man, the myth, the legend. L Lauren actually helped invent the business of studying presidential transitions in the 1950s at the Brookings Institution. Uh, with the advent of nuclear weapons, suddenly this long period between when one president's elected uh, and the other president hands over power suddenly became super consequential. And um, Lauren spent 10 years at Brookings working on that, including helping brief an incoming Kennedy administration. He then came to UVA and served on the faculty in the politics department and helped design the Miller Center. He was turned to when Mr. Miller was about to make his gift. And they asked him, given his experience at Brookings, what should a place like the Miller Center do? And his fingerprints are all over the blueprints for this organization. And more than fingerprints, we actually have photographic evidence. Um, one of the first things we did at the Miller Center was an oral history of the Ford administration. And I hope we can pull the picture up. We can't. Well, uh, as you're walking out the uh, the event space later today, when you walk down the hallway, there's a picture. You'll see a young Dick Cheney and a young Don Rumsfeld and Brent Scowcroft, for whom there is no photographic evidence of him ever having been young. And standing next to Brent Scowcroft is Lauren Henry in the front row. This was the Ford oral history, and it got us in the business of doing oral histories. So Lauren, thank you for joining us today. There it is. Lauren um, is in the first row right next, uh, there, right there in the first row, all the way on the right next to Brent Scowcroft. Bill, you're bearing the lead, though. He's 102, so in a few <laughs> years, he'll have the experience to run for president. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, thanks you for being with us. You're a mentor to us all. So, uh, he's also a neighbor and uh, and a regular Miller Center attendee. So let's let's come back to Chris. Chris, the book is really terrific. As I said, it's the presidency on Zen. It's how you would want to run a presidency, even though Chris accounts for the idea that disruptions and crises happen. Um, but Chris, let's start at the beginning, which is at some level starting at the end. The book looks ahead and it looks backward. It's called the five-year presidency. Year zero starts the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, but it also starts with a core organizing principle, which is the president needs to know what his or her legacy is going to be. It structures all five years. Unpack that for us. How does that all work in your in your mind. Sure, so uh, let me just, a couple of thanks before I answer your question. Firstly, to yourself, Bill, and the Miller Center and, and everything that you and the team do to contribute to making the government better, which is totally what I'm uh, focused on inside the book. And secondly, I just think it's wonderful to be in this little triangle with Lauren in front of me here, uh, Martha and Dave on either side of me. One of the wonderful things about transition work is it's bipartisan and you stand on the shoulders of those who've come before you. So I was very proud to meet Lauren a few months ago and take a photo of him holding his book, me holding mine. And uh, one of the first things I read 
when I did the Romney transition uh, ten odd years ago was was Lauren's great work from, and then Martha's also uh, made an incredible contribution over the years. I stand on, on the shoulders of her work and Dave for his book as well. So I'm in the middle of a wonderful triangle. So I just want to recognise everyone on the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, so take a step back. What are we trying to solve, and, and where does the book fit into it? The fundamental problem we have is is that we have a crisis of trust in the country. And I'm sure you've seen the various studies, but the ones that struck me uh, recently were more than 70% of people think the country's on the wrong track. And probably even more starkly with respect to, to, to my work, uh, I saw a Gallup survey a few months ago that said there's no institution in the country where more than 50% of people have a trust that it's going to do the right thing. And that's across every institution from the judiciary to the government to, uh, to whatever. And so my view is, what do we do about it? You can observe it and you can complain about it, but at the end of the day, you have to do something about it. And I believe that that starts with the White House, which I think is the most important institution in the country in a lot of ways, and is what I describe as the head and the heart of the government. So you can try and solve the public sector, you can try and solve the government overall, but if you don't solve the White House, it's unlikely to be effective. And so all of my recommendations are around how do we make the White House more effective for the people in the country, and hopefully in doing that, start to rebuild trust in one of the most important institutions that we have. Now, my book is not going to solve all of those problems, but a journey of a mile to, starts with a few steps. So I have 50 what I hope are reasonably practical suggestions about how to make the White House better. and. The, the, the important thing is that they are inside the control of the president to a large extent or the candidate. So these are not things that rely on miracles. These are things to a large extent that an incoming president uh, or an existing president can do. To your question specifically, one of the important things is in order to have an effective presidency, you have to know where you're going. Like any journey in life, you have to know what the end destination is. And one of the consequential things that you find out working in the White House is you take over and you're buffeted by everything around you. And we see that at the moment, the number of crises that are in the world, the things that happen that are outside your control. So unless you have a strong North Star that you're heading towards, you will be buffeted left and right and you will lose your way quite quickly. So it's critically important that you have an idea of what is the legacy that you wish to leave for the country and work backwards from that. From there, the most important first step in that legacy is year one. And in the way the government is set up and the way the White House is set up, you have a very small window in year one to get substantial legislation passed and to really get momentum in your administration. And if you don't get that, you're on the back foot immediately and then you start to get buffeted around. But you can't have a successful year one if you don't have a success for what I describe as year zero, which as you point out has started around now. And year zero is critical because there is just so much to do once you're elected or re-elected. And it's impossible to have a strong governance structure and a strong momentum if you haven't done all the work that leads up to it. So it's critical that you do all the work that's necessary to have a strong year, z year one in year zero appointing all the right people, the thousands of people that you need in order to make your administration work, to get your policy initiatives ready to go and launched very quickly, to get the team together that you uh, are going to rely on in the White House, and to build the culture of that team and the mechanisms about how you're going to make decisions. There's just so much to do in this tiny little window between election and inauguration, way too much than it's possible to do if you stand if you start from uh, just the election. So year zero is critical to leading to year one, which is critical to delivering the legacy. So let's bring in Martha and Dave here. Martha, you've, you've studied so many of these transitions, and in particular, you looked at this um, transition from Bush to Obama in the middle of a financial crisis. Uh, how did both of those presidents, outgoing Bush and incoming Obama think about the year beforehand, and then how did it work in that in that period? Well, um, 
there was a recognition on both sides that there was a, a financial crisis. And, um, and so they worked together. Josh Bolton is the uh, chief of staff, worked with Rahm Emanuel um, to try to see what they could do, whether it was the automobile industry was particularly what um, they were concerned with, um, a, a collapse in it. Um, so they, they met together and, um, uh, and the Bush people wanted to appoint a czar for the uh, auto industry, but uh, to handle the, um, uh, the issues. But the um, Obama people decided that they did not want to do that, that um, uh, an incoming president doesn't want to, uh, to bring problems on themselves that come from the last administration. Um, so it, it, um, it, they worked well together, but a lot of it was because of the people and the, um, the work that they had done beforehand. Josh Bolton had done a great deal of work with um, the Obama team, um, brought both representatives of both um, Obama and McCain into the White House during the summer. And uh, before the conventions, because the conventions were late, and said, you know, you need to get your people in place. We're going to uh, uh, hasten the process of security clearances. We'll um, have you submit the names to the FBI. They won't be going through the White House, so you won't have to worry about about leaks. And he went beyond what had done been done before. And uh, that was very helpful, you know, establishing that relationship, I think. Um, the, the, um, uh, the recommendations that, um, that Chris has for the planning beforehand, I, th I think we have uh, an example of an effort to do that, and that is the Biden administration. And um, uh, Joe Biden, as a, um, a candidate, had um, worked on transition legislation in, uh, in the Senate. And, um, and so he decided to, um, to start early, right after Bernie Sanders um, uh, left uh, the presidential race, which was on April 7th, <laughs> 2020. Then um, uh, Biden knew the stakes from his time in the Obama administration. And so he called Ted Kaufman, who you um, spoke of, who took his seat in the Senate and had been his chief of staff and was a very trusted um, aide by him and, and still a trusted uh, friend and, um, uh, and confidant. So he called uh, Ted and said, do you think it's time to start the transition? And Already, um, Ted Kaufman and Mark Stein, who also had uh, worked with uh, Biden, had been his, uh, worked for him when he was in the Senate. The uh, two of them worked with the Partnership for Public Service and with Dave and, and his staff to um, figure out what needed to be done, and especially for what kind of crises might come up. Because, because the Obama administration had to deal with such a crisis. Um, so they set up one of the uh, uh, really unusual projects of theirs were unconventional challenges. Um, they anticipated that they were going to have uh, difficulty. And so um, they had a separate unit that dealt with that. And then after, um, after uh, Biden asked uh, Ted about uh, setting up um, transition, uh, he met with, um, uh, with uh, Ted and Mark, and um, they, um, they met on uh, with Ted on the 22nd of April and talked about what needed to be done. And then uh, he wanted some recommendations on who was going to run the day-to-day -day operation. And they chose Jeff Zeinst. And um, Zeinst had, uh, had 
been brought in in the Obama administration whenever there were um, <laughs> whenever there were problems. Cash for clunkers was his first one, and then the failure of the White House website on health care. And so by mid um, mid May, they had their team set up. They had the coordination mechanisms with the campaign so the two would, would be in sync. And I think all of that had to do with the experience that they had had uh, coming into the Obama administration. So maybe, Dave, this is a great place for you to pick up your managing this nonprofit enter enterprise, working between the, the sitting president and the Democratic challenger. Um, and then turning the corner into the fall, looking ahead, we're thinking about what a turbulent transition might look like. What, what are you seeing, hearing, saying, and particularly in working with uh, the sitting Trump administration? So first of all, let me echo uh, my thanks to the Miller Center and also to Nadine. Um, when I was running this project on the transition, I turned to the Miller Center all the time for guidance and background. Um, and because both the knowledge and the history I guess if, if Thomas Jefferson were writing a paper for Professor Silverstone's class and the assignment was to design a transition, they would fail because it's an, you have an organization, the most important organization in the world, and everybody leaves and new people come in. We, Chris and I both have a corporate background. When there's a, a CEO change, Usually the CFO may leave and a few other people may leave, but basically there's continuity outside of a few people. Here, the entire cabinet, sub-cabinet, deputies, all the way down, 4,000 people leave. And I, you know, Chris describes leaving on the last day of the Trump administration. I remember coming in the first day of the Clinton administration. It's a ghost town in the White House. There's nobody there. So um, we, I was working very closely with the Biden team, as Martha said, uh, starting in March to kind of design the transition. But I also was working with Chris on the possibility of a second Trump term and what, what does a second term transition look like? And also the uncomfortable situation that Chris had to manage of what if Trump lost? And I remember there was, uh, I'll tell a little story. Josh Bolton, who is the Bush chief of staff, and I were working very closely with Chris, and we had a dinner at my house. This was during COVID, and it was outside. And then it started, we had like a monsoon rain. So we moved into my garage <laughs> for a, a nice dinner. And Chris basically laid out possible scenarios. He said, let's take the cleanest scenarios, a clean Trump win or a strong Biden win. Okay. Then you could have something in the middle where it's, you know, a strong Biden win, strong enough that Trump concedes or a strong Trump win. But the other side concedes. And then I have this nightmare scenario where it's sufficiently close and Trump denies the outcome of the election. So we said, oh, that would be bad, but the likelihood of that is probably pretty low. <laughs> and then two days after the election, Chris called me and said, hey, can you get Josh on the phone? So I patched him in. He said, you remember that dinner where we have the nightmares? <laughs> I said, that's what we have. And so... Um, thankfully for the country, Chris Liddell was in the White House because amid all the chaos, Chris was quietly working a way to ensure the peaceful transfer of power. And not that many people know about that, but this is a great public servant. Um, I think the most important thing is, is personnel. Personnel is policy and personnel runs the function of the government. And I'll just give you some data. So you mentioned 4,000 political positions. 1,250 of them need to be confirmed by the Senate. And this is a problem with the functioning of our government. This is why year zero is so important. Planning starting now. Okay. So the best president of modern times coming out of the gate was Obama. Okay. At day 100, which is kind of April-ish, he had 69 Senate-confirmed positions in the entire government. 69. That's it out of 1,250. Okay. That's April. Okay. Three months later in the Bush presidency, 9-11 happened. So the best of all time at year one was President George W. Bush. He had 521 officials in place. That means that at year one, he had about 40% of the government in place. And by that time, people start leaving. 
And so what, why Chris's book is so important is getting the government and the candidate ready to hit the ground running on day one because you have no time to waste. And that's why all the policy recommendations that the Miller Center, Chris, and others have, have articulated are so important because literally a president does not have the tools for him or her to run the government because the function of government is, is so difficult to set up. Chris, you talk in the book, sticking with personnel, I'm going to go in two directions here. Just to go one and hear quickly from you all about this. You talk about the year zero leadership team. It, it reads YOLT, year, use the number zero, LT. Comes up time and time again. And you're essentially saying that group should be formed now. What is that? Who are those people? How big is that group? If you're Nikki Haley and you win in New Hampshire tonight and you're putting together your year zero leadership team, assuming that Biden and Trump already know who that would be. Who are you recruiting into that group? Yes, yeah, so let me talk about what typically happens and then what may happen. Typically, you have these two parallel processes. So you have the campaign, which is working with the candidate, obviously, to get elected. And then behind the scenes, you have the people working on the transition plan. And those are really two separate but obviously related organizations. So most people think about, when they think about the year zero, they think about the campaign. They're off running the events and the debates and so forth. And that's critically important. If you don't get elected, then you don't have anything to govern. But the transition work is quite separate to that. Generally speaking, a bit quieter, uh, but equally important because once you get elected, then you have to govern. And if you're not ready to govern, you're gonna be ineffective as we talked about before. The Year Zero leadership team is just a term I'm using for the group that would lead the second of those efforts. Martha uh, mentioned already uh, what happened in the Biden administration, uh, but typically in the Romney case, for example, uh, Governor Mike Levitt and myself were appointed around March, April to lead that effort. And we built a team up from starting with the two of us to 500. Uh, and I'm sure similar thing happened in the Biden administration. So all I am recommending in the book is that the same general effort has had, but it's much more established. And the important thing that I probably add is it's not only important to have that team there to deliver the governance structure once you win, it could form the nucleus of the team that then is the White House because the sort of skills that you need in order to build a transition are the sort of skills that you then need to run the White House. So it's not necessarily political skills, although they're important, they're more important on the campaign. It's more about how do we choose the right people? How do we organize those people? How do we build a culture of, of performance around the president? Uh, how do we take policy and implement it. So all the skills that are necessary in the transition planning are the same sort of skills that you need to have a successful White House. Now, no positions are ever given out pre-election, but it's a, it's a training ground. And if you like, it's an opportunity for the president, presidential candidate to look at a group of people and say, hmm, okay, maybe these are the people that I might want to have in somewhere in my administration. And the point I make in the book is, it's a lot easier to decide whether you want them or don't want them to than to invite someone in and find out a month or two later that you made the wrong decision. National security ends up coming into this, Chris. It's, uh, it's a big part of... Uh, the president has uh, probably more unilateral authority in national security than in any other sphere. And there's a big standing government, you know, of the, f of the 4 million government employees, 2 million are men and women either in uniform or in the military, defense and intelligence services. And the NSC staff is kind of a stable body. So tell me a little bit about that. Are you, are you planning the national security team as part of the year zero leadership team? 100%. And, and just take a step back. If, if domestic policy takes a month or two longer than it should to get implemented, that's not great for the president, but it's not critical. If there's a national security crisis over the interregnum between the election and inauguration or in the early days of an administration, that can be literally and figuratively life-threatening. So of all of the things that are important, getting a fully functional national security team in place as quickly as possible is probably the most important. 
And the good news, and both Martha and Dave have written about this, the good news is, generally speaking, the outgoing National Security Administration and the incoming cooperate very closely because uh, there's a, firstly, there's a high degree of professionalism on, generally on both sides, and they both understand the stakes. And so even in the difficult uh, transition of, that we had last time in 2020 and 2021, Robert O'Brien, who was the outgoing National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, who was the incoming, worked very closely together to make sure that any national security issues would be dealt with. Great. Dave, Martha? I agree. And I would say that if you look at history, and the, the Miller Center has published uh, a number of books on this, national security crises don't wait for a president to take office. They happen when they happen. And so there have been a series of crises in the history of the United States that have happened in January, February, you know, March, April. So, for example, Clinton took office and the, world tra the first World Trade Center bombing was two months after he took office. Going back to personnel, Bush had less than half of his national security people in place uh, when 9-11 occurred. You remember he had the Bush v. Gore dispute in uh, Florida, which meant that he only had a 35-day transition versus a 75-day transition. And so when the 9-11 Commission, which I think is another UVA Miller Center um, uh, official, when they did their autopsy of what happened during 9-11, one of their conclusions was the transition and the delay in getting personnel in place put the country at greater risk on 9-11 because Bush didn't have his full national security team in place. So of the recommendations that Chris highlights, among the most important is ensuring that the national security transition is, is as smooth as possible. And um, be, before, in, in a sense that you can uh, get that team in place, you need a White House team. The White House team is going to um, help the president decide on what decision-making process he wants. And so that is going to be something that's critically important uh, during the transition. And then once he decides how he wants to make decisions, what kind of information he wants when a decision is right, uh, then uh, uh, then you can start filling out, uh, beginning with the NSC. Uh, shortly after the inauguration, uh, Biden swore in 206 White House staff, that they saw that the White House staff was going to be important. They worried about getting uh, Senate, uh, um, Senate confirmed people through. And so what they focused on were the people in policymaking positions who were not confirmed. And so they filled those positions. And uh, by inauguration time, they had um, 1,100 non-confirmed personnel. Mm -hmm. the, um, the risk in that, though, is that the department secretary gets confirmed comes in and his staff is already there and he would like or she would like to appoint their own people. So you have some uh, conflict there, but they thought it was very important right at the start to, um, uh, to get those people in place. And then uh, with the NSC was, uh, was critical and Jake Sullivan had worked with um, with Biden, as had Tony Blinken. And the two of them could work well together in the Secretary of State and the White House positions. Coordination was going to be an important part of it. Coordination is a great pivot to process. And, and Dave and Chris have both mentioned process before. Chris, I, in the book, you talk about, and I'm forgetting the exact phrase, something like um, uh, position conflict, but not personality conflict. I forget your exact phrase there, but encouraging people to debate, disagree, and then putting decisions up in front of the president. And as we'll come back to in a second, decision point is actually only in the middle of a broad process. But talk a little bit about process, culture, 
How does an incoming team do that? When do they establish those processes? Is it January 20th or is it before that? When they can is as late as that. And that's what I'm arguing against, that really you, could, you want to try and start ironing some of those out and, and trying to eliminate the bad actors out of it. Because the worst thing that you can have in a White House is a bad actor, someone who works around the system, someone who leaks, someone who is... You saw none of that in the Trump administration. I saw none of it in the Trump administration. <laughs> Occasionally had to deal with a few of them. But the important thing is, and, and the distinction between uh, the types of conflict is, is critical. You do want conflict of ideas. It's critical that the president gets good and differing opinions. The worst thing that you can have is groupthink. And the president can influence that by... Uh, him or her sort of suggesting what they might want and everyone congregating around it. You want the opposite of that. You want people to challenge the president's ideas and put in front of him or her the most number of different ideas possible so that they are able to make the best possible decisions. But what you don't want is personality conflict because that's corrosive and that's different from idea conflict. So in my role, for example, where I was deputy chief of policy, I'm trying to promote one and eliminate the other. Now, sometimes human nature gets in the way and you have to deal with the other thing, but that can be destructive and working around the system can destroy the quality of the decisions. The other one is constructive because it's giving the president the best number of options and the best researched ideas as well. So you're promoting one, trying to eliminate the other. Dave? Yeah, I mean, I would say that going back to a point that Chris mentioned that the benefit of the work of transition, this is why the work of UVA Press and Miller Center is so important, is that you learn lessons from each transition and then the next people learn those lessons. So going, and Martha wrote a book um, which highlights the Bush to Obama transition. I think that was probably the best and smoothest transition in history. And as a country, we were lucky that both the Obama team planned and the Bush team planned because during the transition, we had the financial crisis and the country benefited from the fact that Bush and Hank Paulson and Josh Bolton cooperated with Bernanke and Tim Geithner and Obama coming in. What happened there was the outgoing chief of staff under the instruction of President Bush. President Bush had a rocky transition coming in, 35 days, 9-11 happened nine months later. And he said to Josh Bolton, I don't want what happened to me to happen to the next leader. And so Josh set up these councils and processes to work with whomever won, McCain or Obama. Obama had a very, very experienced team. And actually, they set up these, the same councils during the transition that would run the government once Obama took over. So Larry Summers... Um, and Jim Jones, who was the National Economic and National Security Council, Tom Donilon was the deputy. They set up mock national security and national economic team processes during the transition to get those kind of policy chops and the, the process and the, and the muscle memory so that once they took office, they were ready to go and the country benefited from that. Just one little anecdote. Um, my book focuses heavily on lessons learned during the previous big financial crisis during a transition was the Hoover to Roosevelt transition. Mm -hmm. There, Hoover and Roosevelt hated each other. Hoover thought that Roosevelt was not worthy of being president and refused to cooperate. And historians would say that the lack of cooperation lengthened the Great Depression, caused more banks to fail, more people to lose their houses, more people to lose their farms, and therefore people starved and died. The Bush to Obama administration, actually the opposite happened. In my view, um, the cooperation accelerated the recovery because of the collaboration between the outgoing and the incoming. Bush was highly unpopular at that point. He was, you know, Iraq war. He was, he was polling in his 20s, but he still felt like he had an obligation to the country regardless of who won. Chris, I'm going, to, I'm going to move us along because we're at about 20 of, and I want to take uh, a few questions from the audience. But I, I want to talk about priorities in particular um, as it relates and maybe connect it to uh, the politics that is passing legislation. In the book, you lay out, and President Trump and President Biden and President Obama have all used executive actions. I think President Obama was the one that 
coined the phrase, I have a pen and a phone strategy. I can sign things and I can call people and tell them to do things. And you argue very strongly in favor, and President Trump famously said, I like executive actions, right? Because I can just get things done. You argue in favor of legislation. Tell us why. Tell us how it works, and including what kinds of legislation you would encourage the next president to think about. And I'll ask you all to think about your questions. Please submit them in writing, and Alfred will collect them and get them up here. Sure. So executive orders, uh, just for those who, who don't understand it in the room, are, are ones that the president signs that he can do unilaterally. They don't require legislation. I describe them as the, the, the sugar. They're, they're, uh, they're sweet and they're easy to eat, but you don't want to have them as your whole diet. At the end of the day, the White House is there to pass legislation. In terms of coming back to your first question, legacy, the the Issues that we remember presidents for are the legislation they passed, not the executive orders, generally speaking. Executive orders, yes, a president can put them in place, but the next president can overturn them straight away. And what you're seeing now increasingly is a tit for tat. So the first thing that each president does once they get in power is they overturn all the executive orders from the previous president. And then the next president comes along and overturns them. So we literally have seen executive orders which have been like a tennis game going backwards and forwards from one administration to the other. So they feel good because you get them done and you make a nice announcement and you get a press release, but then they take a while to implement. And by the time the action that, that comes from the implementation is starting to happen, the next person comes in and overturns them. So they're, part of the, they're certainly part of the arsenal that the president has and they're important, but they're not critical in terms of defining a legacy. The things that define legacies, generally speaking, are legislation because they're the ones that survive multiple administrations. And so my view is certainly going in in the first year, the, th the activity that the president should be really focused on is legacy legislation. So not just legislation, but legacy legislation. There's, we have this tiny window in the country, which is generally speaking the first 200 days or a year to pass significant legislation. After that, we're in year two and people are starting to think about the midterms. Then we have the midterms. And then depending on what happens with Congress, you may or may not get another window. And then we're into a here we are now with one year to go and we're talking about the next election. So the chance to pass legacy legislation is very tiny, the window, and it's in that first year. And when you think about what is going to impact the country in 10 years or 20 years, it's legislation. And when we look at what past presidents have done, generally it's their legislative initiatives that we remember them for. Um, I, I'm going to sort of go into the wonky weeds of presidential first years here, but Chris and I have talked about this, and I, I want to ask him publicly. Chris, Chris makes the recommendation that a president usually gets in the first year two bites at the apple, and typically presidents have gone with partisan legislation first because their fan base has just gotten them elected and they want to reward them, and then they tack back and they get centrist legislation. So president... Clinton got some tax increases that he wanted, and he tacked back and got NAFTA. President Bush got some tax cuts that he wanted. He tacked back and got no child left behind. And you argue the opposite. You say, actually, go with the centrist stuff. President Biden got um, a partisan COVID bill through and then tacked back and got infrastructure. And you, you argue the opposite. Go bipartisan first and then go partisan. Explain that for us a little bit. So it depends a bit on the reality of the Congress that you inherit, but the, the likely reality, which is why the, the recommendation is there, is, is that we're going to have a very tight Congress. And so the, the first question you ask is, why don't we do an FDR, the 100-day legislation, the blitz? Why can't we have that again? Well, if you look at FDR, he had, I think from memory, a 24-seat majority in the Senate and something like 170, 180 seat majority in the House. So it's a lot easier to do partisan legislation than when you have like a 50-50 Senate and a slither of a, in the Biden case, a slither of a uh, majority in the House. So the reality is the way elections are going, and, and almost certainly this year, and this is a wave election, in which case my recommendation might be different, we'll have a, a tight Congress and perhaps a split Congress. 
Well, the chances of getting strong bipartisan, strong partisan legislation through that Congress is tiny. So you have a tiny window and then you make it even smaller. Now, it's not to say it's easy. Bipartisan legislation is difficult in any environment. But if you are ever going to get it done, it's going to be in the first 200 days because that's when you have the greatest goodwill. You have a Congress that's come in. OK, it might be a split Congress or a tight Congress, but they've all just been elected. They all want to get something done. None of them are quite yet worried about their re-election in the midterms. So it's your best opportunity. Why waste that goodwill on ramming through a partisan legislation and alienating the very people who you need to get something done, assuming that it's a tight Congress? So that's the logic. Use that goodwill. It's not going to be easy. It's certainly, uh, I, I recognize all the difficulties in the polarized environment we have, but if there's ever going to be a chance to get legacy bipartisan legislation, and by the way, if it's a legacy, bipartisan is the most likely to survive subsequent administrations. So uh, it's in your first 200 days. Got it. L let, me, let me ask two questions that sort of cluster with each other and open it to the whole panel here. Um, and they have to do with uh, if, if former President Trump um, wins the election this year, what do you expect the transition to look like? What do you expect in terms of staffing and appointments? Will Will people want to come back in and work for the Trump administration again? Um, we, we've seen a lot of uh, media attention to a couple different efforts aimed at not just staffing a, Trump a second Trump administration, but also how to deal with the federal bureaucracy in a Trump administration. That, I'm what does Trump to the do audience and just sit back and listen to this one. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm happy to go into the lion's den on this one. Uh, uh, so. The first thing is I would say do not underestimate the Trump next administration if he's elected. Uh, it is not going to be 2016 again. And the reason I say that is there's a couple of organizations which are doing uh, really strong work, American First Policy Institute and, and Heritage, which if the Trump campaign sets up in a, uh, a transition, they can use the work that's been done to educate themselves and give them some momentum. Now, they won't necessarily do that, but they certainly have that opportunity. That's sort of observation number one. And observation number two, the, the, the Trump campaign to date has been very disciplined and very well run, quite different to the 2016 shoestring. So I think there's a degree of systematic approach, which is quite different. So uh, I don't quite know how that's gonna play out uh, but I wouldn't uh, underestimate their ability to hit the ground running. Yeah, More th yeah the, um, uh, the campaigns don't like to see outside people and organization telling them what they should be doing. They want to focus on the campaign, getting the president elected, and it's the president who decides what should be, uh, what the policy should be, what the priorities should be. On the other hand, you're going to have outside a um, a lot of groups that are going to uh, to push their own agendas, and uh, two that have um, uh, been in the news although one more than the other, is the Heritage Foundation has a Project 2025 that pulls together uh, a lot of conservative organizations and makes very specific recommendations and is very public. For example, um, the head of Heritage this Sunday had an interview in the New York Times about uh, what they were doing. Um, the America First Policy Institute, which is uh, headed by Brooke Rollins, who was the outgoing uh, head of the Domestic Policy Council, is uh, taken a, a much uh, lower profile and has a lot of people from the Trump administration um, in it. The, um, the campaign has, um, uh, has reacted to these, um, to these efforts. And um, and has not been happy. Um, so in November, November thirteenth, um, uh, Susie Wiles and Chris La Civita, 
who run the campaign, said the efforts by various nonprofit groups are certainly appreciated and can be enormously helpful. However, none of these groups or individuals speak for President Trump or his campaign. We will have a transition effort to be announced at a later date. Well, the, um, uh, the efforts continued, particularly Heritage, and by December, I think the campaign had had enough. And so uh, in early December, uh, uh, they've said, despite our crystal clear, uh, <laughs> being crystal clear, some allies haven't gotten the hint. And the media in their uh, anti-Trump zeal has been all too willing to go along. Let us be very specific. Unless a message coming directly from President Trump or an authorized member of the campaign team, no aspect of future presidential staffing or policy announcements should deem official. Let us be even more specific and blunt. People publicly discussing potential administration jobs for themselves or their friends are, in fact, hurting President Trump and themselves. These are unwelcome distractions. Second term priorities and staffing decisions will not, in no uncertain terms, be led by anonymous or thinly sourced speculation. Um, they, the efforts seem to, seem to continue. Um, but um, uh, from a campaign point of view, the campaign workers are working for low, low wages and focused on getting the president elected. And so they're going to be very resentful. And that is a, uh, a problem with transition planning. So one of the things that are done in uh, the campaigns is that they, when they set up a transition uh, operation, they coordinate. So in the Biden case, uh, the top uh, people in the transition uh, had a Saturday Zoom session uh, with the campaign so that they could make sure that they were uh, working together. You spend some time in the book talking about how those teams need to talk to one another. Dave, I'm just curious, if you would look ahead, you know a lot of folks in the in the Biden administration, you work with them as they were going in, coming. What would you expect if, if President Biden gets reelected? How, how would they be thinking about a transition over the next year? And what would you expect a second Biden team to look like? So the Biden team is very experienced. He has a lot of experience. And, the, and Jeff Science is the chief of staff. Jeff is someone that I think listens to uh, former chief of staff. You know, what happens in, in the book, um, I had a dialogue with two former chiefs of staff, Josh Bolton and Dennis McDonough. And the debate was the Bush administration, the Obama administration had a lot less turnover in the second term than the Bush administration. Josh Bolton, who was Bush's chief of staff, said, well, I actually think that's not a good thing because a second term president needs fresh eyes, fresh legs and fresh perspectives. People are tired. They're exhausted. And you kind of get groupthink. So I, I think that a second ter the best practice for a second term president is to really take a fresh look at his or her team and refresh it because you need new energy, new ideas and new and you need to invigorate the administration in order to have the energy in the second terms. Martha, in her writing, points out that second term presidencies are much less active and much less successful than first terms, it's just harder, the easier stuff has been done, and the country tires of the president in the second term. It's happened to the last number of second term presidents. So it's hard to predict what Biden will do. I would say best practice would be to take a, a very hard look and, and to refresh. So there's a quick follow up on that, not explicitly that way, but it, it's quite interesting. So does Vice President, Bi uh, Vice President Harris have a tr transition planner team given President Biden's current state of health? I think Chris should answer that one. <laughs> uh, well, take a step back. Always in the, in the first term transitions, you always have a team that's focused on the vice president and making sure that person is set up successfully. So yes, the vice president has a team focused on making sure that they transition. 
I think it might be getting a little ahead of themselves for the vice president to be doing transition planning about how they become the president. So I don't think that would probably be appropriate. But uh, it, vice president Harris, I'm sure, has a team thinking about what are going to be her, her fundamental planks in her second term as vice president. So there are a couple of questions in here. And in fact, even in the run up to the event, several people asked me about um, how important are career federal employees during the transition um, this is a technical question, but an important one. Had Schedule F been fully Im implemented, could have that have undermined the transition in 2020 to 2021? Do you want to unpack that for us, uh, Dave, Chris, or Martha? Let me start with, um, so the, the career civil servants are absolutely essential for a transition. Um, they provide the stability in the government because there's an absence of stability by definition. And you often have departments, I'll just go back to even the, you remember Tim Geithner, who was the treasury secretary in, in when Obama came in, he had the turbo tax issue, very experienced, very accomplished leader. That meant that the treasury department confirmations were delayed during a financial crisis. And famously, some journalists said he was home alone. They had, he was the only confirmed official for months in the treasury department. So career civil servants, are really important. Again, I want to give Chris Liddell credit. We we talked during the outgoing Trump transition, or we didn't know it was going to be an outgoing Trump transition, but there's a woman that was running the transition for the civil service named Mary Jabert. And Chris was operating in a very, very dicey situation. He was planning the potential second Trump term, but also planning for the possibility of Trump losing and the need for a peaceful transfer of power. So Chris actually cut through about 17 bureaucratic layers and worked directly with the career federal serv civil servants. And I think part of this was good practice and good policy, but also I think politically, you can tell me, but politically inside the Trump administration, it was seen as less political or less problematic for you to be working with just career civil servants who were responsible for the operation of the government. So. It's absolute best practice. I think Chris has a number of recommendations in his book and in my book to further empower career civil servants to take responsibility during the transition because there's change at the political level and the country needs stability. Yeah, yeah 100% endorse that. The, they're the connective tissue between administrations. And so they, they play a critical role for the incoming administration because they provide all of the agency briefing books, all the sort of knowledge, and they're there afterwards as well. Uh, so they're not only prepare the administration for coming in, but when all the politicals from the outgoing leave and there's an issue, they have the knowledge base and the how to get things done. So they're incredibly important from a connective tissue perspective. So we, can I get, we can I get one other point, yeah. sorry, <laughs> Please. very quickly. So I remember Chris was having a meeting in the uh, West Wing of the White House and Mary, you know, she's about 12, 15 layers down from Chris. She's never been to the West Wing of the White House. And she was being called on to present the transition plan. So she called me that next morning and she said, I didn't sleep all night. I've never been as nervous to go to a meeting like this. What am I supposed to do? And I said, you've trained for this for 30 years. Just go be yourself. And I remember Chris sent his deputy in to see Mary. She was very nervous. And, he, and his deputy just said, just be yourself. You know this. And she killed it at the meeting. And she did a very professional, great job. And so that, I think, was a good act of, of responsible uh, leadership on both Chris's part and also Mary's part. So we have, we have, we're right at an hour, but I'm going to give you each a lightning round, and you can choose from one of these two final questions. Can I put you can use one your one here? minute to answer your own question if you want, Martha. <laughs> yeah. The two questions I'm going to ask are, how does the U.S. transition process compare to other advanced democracies what worries you most about the 2024 election or what makes you hopeful about the state of our democracy? So you each get a minute. Well, uh, um, the GSA starts work in General Services Administration on transition the day after the, um, the inauguration. So they have an operation that's ongoing and there is an agency transition directors council that has the 15 departments and then it has the five largest agencies. And so the people that come to those are people who have worked on transitions past for their departments. 
um, what worries me most in in um, uh, in looking abroad, the um, the U.S. had been a um, uh, a beacon as far as the peaceful transfer of power, and um, you can just see worldwide the difficulties, whether it's uh, Guatemala um, or it is West Africa, uh, the difficulties in uh, in transitions and even getting a, uh, the election. Uh, certified and the the president in in office. So worldwide, that is what uh, what uh, concerns me. Um, I I think that um, in a second term uh, uh, Trump administration, uh, Chris is certainly right. The campaign has been run very differently, and I think a transition would as well. And there are always people who are willing to serve. Um, the pipelines, whether the Heritage and American Policy Institute pipelines turn out, um, you'll have to see what, uh, what people there are. But um, presidents want to have a, a legacy that's uh, positive. Dave, and then we'll let Chris have the final word. I, I worry that this is going to be a very difficult year in our history. Um, we have two competing presidents where whomever wins the other side, I think will think the outcome is horrible. Uh, we have one president who is gonna spend half, or one candidate who's gonna spend half his time on the campaign trail and the other half in the courtroom. And one never knows. So, and I still remember January 6th and what a terrible day in history that was. And I worry that President Trump should he lose, will not recognize the outcome of the election. That could lead to further violence. So um, I think it's going to be a very, very challenging year and one where hopefully we can learn the positive lessons from history from the Miller Center and have a stronger future. Uh, look, there's, look, there's plenty to worry about, and I don't want to trivialize it at all, not just domestically, but internationally, when we see all the things that are going on in the world at the moment. But I'm just an optimist. I, I th I think we tested the institution of, of the White House and everything associated with it in 2021, 2020, 2021, and it, it stood. Nothing happened on January 20th except the inauguration of a new president. And so I believe in the institutional strength of the country, and I believe that we are getting better. So all the work that, that Lauren kicked off, uh, Martha and David contributed, hopefully I've contributed, are making the process better and the institution better. So. I mentioned the crisis of trust in institutions. I'm a believer in institutions. I think they're a lot better off than most people realize. And I think we're gonna make them stronger and I think the system will be fine. Well, um, I hope you will all join me in thanking uh, Chris for his public service, his terrific book, um, his, for his being with us today, as well as Dave and Martha who made the trip down uh, for their service and for um, them being part of our network and our world. I want to thank you all uh, for coming, particularly the, the many governing council members and other supporters of the center who are here, our faculty, our staff who put together this great event. We're looking forward to 24. I'm re remaining relentlessly optimistic about the year, and that's not looking past any of the challenges, including the ones that um, we've talked about today, but basically because as a, as a country, I think we're so committed uh, to our democracy, and I think that that ultimately will prevail whatever happens in the election. So with that, thank you, and I look forward to 2024. Chris will, Chris will be available to sign his book out back. I think we may...